Well, this is an interest, interesting study, um, and this is one tumor that particularly avails itself to pathologic study. And I think the study of the morphology has really formed the basis of what biologic questions are important and what biologic questions are answerable in this tumor. So it was really neat as a pathologist to be able to look at a tumor and study a tumor from under the microscope and, and make predictions, and most of them were wrong, but make predictions about what might be happening in the genetics of the tumor. And then we got a team together who knew what they were doing, and we got a little bit lucky. So I, I always start out with saying uh, the name of this tumor really originated from the belief that the tumor arose from organ precursor cells, or blasts, from within the lung or lining of the lung, pleuropulmonary blastoma. And the tumor was first described in 1988 by my mentor and, and really professional father, Pepper Daner. And the tumor is a sarcoma, meaning it derives from the mesenchyme or the interstitial cells of the lung. These are the cells that, in the developing lung, become the connective tissue in the vascular system. And it's, it's to be differentiated from carcinomas the epithelial, that derive from the epithelial cells. And it's akin to other organ-based embryonal tumors such as nephroblastoma or Wilms tumor, as you've probably heard of it, rhabdomyosarcoma, a primitive sarcoma of skeletal muscle, neuroblastoma, and hepatoblastoma. These are tumors that live in that borderland between development and carcinogenesis. And the tumor starts in lung development and begins as a cystic abnormality of the airspace with the potential then to progress to a malignant tumor. It's a very rare tumor. There's been approximately 450 cases known worldwide since its original description. There's approximately 25 to 35 cases per year in the United States. And I guess one could argue in some, although not successfully right now, that studying such a rare disease, what's the point? Um, like these other tumors, the Wilms tumor, neuroblastoma, greater than 90% of them occur in, in children under six years of age. And this is our first uh, picture from our first uh, PPB family meeting in 2006 when we got a, a group of 24 families together from 17 states across the country to um, meet each other, um, meet us, and participate in our genetic study. So the study went something like this. I, in 2004, uh, as a pathologist, I had a geneticist friend who was a mentor of mine, and I asked her, what would we need to do if we wanted to do a linkage study? This tumor runs in families, and we think it might, might provide a clue to us to getting to the genetic basis. And the questions were, how common is it? How can you get access to the families? I said, well, it's very rare, but there is a, there's an already built infrastructure in the International PPB Registry which is based in uh, Children's Hospitals and Clinics of Minnesota. They have a great website. And I was part of that registry. Um, it was sort of inherited part of that registry from my mentor, Pepper Daner. And so we may have access and we may have an ability to contact families to see if they're willing to participate. So, so I think it could be feasible. And she said, well, if you think it could be feasible, then you're going to need a cancer geneticist, a statistical geneticist. And I'm thinking, that's a lot of geneticists and a medical geneticist to evaluate the pedigrees and a genetics counselor to help bring in, the, bring in the people. And I said, okay, fine, who are these people? And in our institution at Washington University, we actually had these people. And uh, I brought the head of the registry down to meet them and try to convince them that it would be worth spending time outside of their day job helping us design a study to find what is it that's causing this cancer. Uh, we, got, we got lucky in a number of ways. We did a linkage study first with four families. There were 14 affected members in these families. Uh, um, the linkage study yielded a peak, a common peak, a common chromosomal region that suggested that each of these families, each of the affected members, had inherited a piece of a chromosome that could be shared. It wasn't the exact same piece of chromosome between families, but it was the same area in the chromosome. That region had 70 genes. And not being a uh, fancy uh, scientist, I did a PubMed search from 1 to 70. The third one I looked up was Dicer. Dicer 1 and Lung. And I found a recent report in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that showed when you knock out Dicer 1 in lung epithelium, you get lung cysts in the mouse. And I said, well, that's got to be it. I looked at the pictures. The pictures very much resemble the beginnings of PPB in, in young children. The thing that I couldn't figure out was that Dicer was knocked out in the epithelium in this mouse model, and yet I'm looking at a sarcoma. The epithelium that's associated with these tumors, the cystic part, 
that stays benign. It's the, sarco- it's the mesenchymal cells that become the sarcoma. So what in the world is going on? Nevertheless, I thought it was a good candidate gene. Um, I showed it to some of my colleagues, and they say, oh, don't you wish it would be nicer? Because that's pretty cool. Um, we sequenced the four probands in the families of the linkage study, and each had a unique mutation in DICER, predicted to be deleterious. Then we sequenced seven additional probands from seven additional families that showed multifocal disease, and each of them also had a deleterious DICER-1 mutation. How lucky can you get? So there's three main important points. So we studied how risk for PPV was transmitted in families using genetics. And the finding of DICER-1 mutation conferring predisposition to a hereditary cancer syndrome is extremely significant. And that is because DICER-1 is a very important gene. It essentially is responsible for for making antibodies to our own RNA messages as a way to silence or fine-tune gene expression. I like to think of it as a dimmer switch. You can turn genes off, gene expression off, or you can modulate gene expression in a certain range. And it can do so in a tissue-specific and a developmental stage-specific way. And it's been thought that that DICER-1 is very important in stem cells development and in cancer. But until the study, it hadn't been directly linked or or hadn't been a direct cause of a cancer syndrome. So, So I think that's a very important point and probably why I'm standing up here today. So then... After that, we said, well, what's happening in the tumors? Most of the children in these families are actually normal, even the ones that inherit DICER mutations, heterozygous DICER mutations. So something else must happen. And the easiest explanation would be that there is a second hit in the tumors themselves. So this is an example of an early stage of pleuropulmonary blastoma. There is normal lung epithelium on the top. And I say normal, I mean normal looking. Okay, Then the tumor cells are these guys right here, and they condense underneath this epithelium as if they are responding to some diffusible factor from the epithelium. You can see as you get further away from the epithelium, the density of the cells and the proliferative activity of the cells decreases. So could it be that this epithelium really is is the thing that's important? So we hypothesized then, based on what we knew from the mouse model, that the growth of the mesenchymal tumor cells was being driven by a diffusible factor or growth factor made by the epithelial cells, and that that expression of that diffusible factor is regulated by microRNAs. That's all hypothesis right now. We haven't proven any of that, but that's our speculation. When we stained the tumors with DICER, we noticed that the tumor cells retained expression of DICER, and that would indicate that they retained the wild-type copy of DICER-1. They'd obviously inherited a bad copy, but retained the wild-type copy and were producing protein. But look at the epithelium on the surface here. It's negative. DICER-1 is present in every cell in the body, and it's stainable in every cell in the body. And here we have tumor-associated epithelium as negative. So I think that's a little bit of evidence that our hypothesis may be correct. No DICER-1, no microRNAs can be made. There's no dimming of the growth factor signal to the cells below. That's yet to be proven. So I think the other interesting thing about this is we were all set to go cut out these cells right here and do an expression array and find out what do these cells have in common and what caused this cancer, when in fact if we had done that, we wouldn't have learned. We, were, we would be sort of looking, looking in all the wrong places for what caused this cancer. Instead, we needed to look at the epithelium. We were very lucky to find this. And if this pans out to be true, we were extremely lucky. As the tumor progresses, the tumor cells overgrow this epithelium so there's none left. It just so happened that in our cohort of 11 patients, six of them still had epithelium left for evaluation. Five of those six had areas that showed loss of DICER-1. Most important point number three, the study of rare diseases is very important. PPB is just the latest example of a long list, starting probably with retinoblastoma. And much gratitude and credit needs to be directed to the people who got us to this point where we can make these discoveries. And this includes the investigators that had the foresight and the interest to start collecting these cases. And the small grassroots organizations that provided the funding to start and maintain the PPB registry and those that contributed to the recent experiments. These are the number of funding sources it took to to pull up the funds to find this gene. And then 
as, as I've heard so many times today already, this really is a team science approach. I am a pathologist and I'm not a geneticist. I've, I've learned a whole lot about, about disease and pathogenesis of disease from my colleagues who participated in this study. And there are numerous institutions and they are in eight different departments at Washington University contributed to the study.